Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nirav Shah. I'm the director of Maine's Center for Disease Control and Prevention. I'm joined today by Governor Janet Mills, Commissioner Heather Johnson of the Department of Economic and Community Development, and Commissioner Jean Lambrew of Maine's Department of Health and Human Services. And we're all here to, today to provide an update on all things COVID-19 going on in the state of Maine for today, Thursday, August 20th, 2020. I'll begin with a brief public health update and then turn things over to Governor Mills. We begin today's update on a somber note. The Maine CDC is reporting the passing of the 128th person in Maine with COVID-19. This individual was a woman in her 80s from York County. We offer her friends, family, and her entire community our deepest condolences during this time. Overall, across the state, there are now a total of 4,253 cases of COVID-19, representing an increase of 19 cases since yesterday. Of those, 3,812 are confirmed cases and 441 are probable cases. Right now in the state, there are seven individuals in the hospital with COVID-19, one of whom is in the ICU, and one of whom is also on a ventilator. As I mentioned a moment ago, there have been 128 deaths with, from among individuals with COVID-19 and 3,679 have recovered, an increase of 17 recoveries since yesterday. Among our cases are 944 healthcare workers as well. Before I turn to some updates on the outbreak front, I wanted to note a milestone that our laboratory here in Augusta recently passed. In the recent days, the Health and Environmental Testing Laboratory, which is part of Maine CDC and DHHS, reported out over its 50,000th sample of COVID-19 testing. Just to put that number in context, 50,000 tests is more than the entire clinical microbiology section at the main CDC laboratory runs in a normal entire year. And yet they've done just that. They've exceeded that number in just about five months, just with COVID-19 testing alone. It's important to note that even though our focus has been on bringing COVID-19 testing online and ramping up availability, other parts of our laboratory are still online doing vital public health testing for diseases like rabies, tuberculosis, and as we're in the midst of mosquito season, mosquito-borne illnesses as well. So I'd like to take a second to commend and thank the entire team over at the, Hel the Heddle Main CDC Laboratory for all the efforts that they've put in. I'd like to next talk about some of the outbreaks that Main CDC has been working on. The first one is an outbreak associated with the York County Jail. To be sure, this is information that Maine CDC has just received over the past few hours. I'd like to talk about what we know thus far and note that all, everything thus far, as with any outbreak, may change as our investigation unfolds. But this morning, Maine CDC was notified of four cases of COVID-19 associated with the York County Jail and the York County Sheriff's Department. We opened an outbreak investigation upon receiving that notification and thus far have made contact with officials at the Sheriff's Department in the jail. As I mentioned, we're aware right now of four cases among employees at the York County Jail and Sheriff's Department. We've been working very closely with them throughout the day to arrange for testing of other employees as well as inmates at that facility. We've also been working with them to ensure that their PPE needs are met and that any other requests for assistance or resources that the jail may have are being fulfilled as quickly as possible. Our epidemiology team is beginning its outbreak investigation into trying to determine where the COVID-19 may have been introduced and to whom else in the facility it may have been transmitted to. As testing is undertaken and results are delivered, we'll have a better sense of where we are from an epidemiological standpoint. As those data come in, we will be sure to keep everyone updated. I'd also next like to provide a bit more of an update on an outbreak associated with wedding gatherings in Millinocket. I'd first like to report that 
In the recent hours, Maine CDC has delivered an imminent health hazard citation to the Big Moose Inn. The imminent health hazard citation notes that Big Moose Inn exceeded the indoor gathering limit of 50 individuals when it hosted a wedding reception on Friday, August 7th. In more detail about the outbreak itself, right now, there are 32 cases associated with the wedding and reception that occurred on Friday, August 7th in and around the Millinocket area. Of those 32 cases, 26 are confirmed and six are probable cases. Our investigation is ongoing and I wanted to share some early epidemiological information about this outbreak. As I mentioned, both gatherings were held on Friday, August 7th. The wedding ceremony itself was held at the Tritown Baptist Church in East Millinocket, and as we've discussed, the reception at the Big Moose Inn. Preliminary interviews have suggested that there were approximately 65 guests at the wedding and the reception. The median age of confirmed cases thus far is 42 years, with a range of those who have tested positive spanning age four all the way up to age 78. Seven cases right now are among children under the age of 18. Most of the cases that have been detected thus far have been individuals who are symptomatic. About 87% thus far are symptomatic. That's not uncommon in outbreak investigations. In large outbreak investigations or even any outbreak investigation, we typically learn of individuals who are symptomatic first. And then as we conduct more and more testing, we learn of individuals who are positive, who have not yet started showing symptoms. So at this phase of the outbreak investigation, that is not an atypical finding. Five of the cases thus far reside in Somerset County and the, re the rest in Penobscot County. One guest reported be developing symptoms the day after the wedding on Saturday, August 8th. However, most of the cases who have tested positive, 11, reported an onset of symptoms about four days after the wedding and reception gatherings, which is about the typical incubation period for COVID-19. I just wanna remind everyone that as our investigation continues, we keep our focus on the care and well being of those who are ill. That is, at the end of the day, what an epidemiological investigation is about. It involves helping people who are sick and helping prevent others from becoming sick. Before I turn things over to Governor Mills, a quick update on testing. Yesterday, based on 2,935 PCR tests reported to Maine CDC, the one day positivity rate was 0.44%. That brings our seven day positivity rate to now 0.78%. Again, for national context around that number, the national average for PCR positivity remains at 7.5% across the country. That concludes my part of the update. I'm gonna turn things over to Governor Mills. I'm unmuted. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Thank you for uh, your update. Um, I'm also joined today by uh, Commissioner Lambrew and Commissioner Johnson to answer any questions about what we're gonna be talking about, and including perhaps a brief statement by Commissioner Lambrew about some more swab and send uh, sites that we're announcing today, uh, raising our total to I think 27 swab and send sites across the state of Maine, aiming to be available within 30 miles of 90% of the people of the state of Maine. Look, uh, since the outdate, since the outset of this pandemic, Maine people have been writing me cards and letters by the hundreds, Facebook and Instagram accounts, uh, messages as well, and emails. I read them all, and they are many of them filled with hope and heartbreak in equal measure. Dozens of those messages have come from small businesses, um, owners of people like corner stores and um, the local mom and pop, the bed and breakfast, the local diner, independent bookstores, all these small businesses uh, who have faced unprecedented challenges caused by this pandemic and from the heartbreak of temporarily closing their doors to the Herculean task of reopening to the public in new and innovative ways. 
In addition to the threat of the public health, threats of the public health, the COVID-19 pandemic has fundamentally changed the global business environment, creating severe supply chain disruptions, reducing consumer spending, and causing unprecedented losses felt across all sectors of the national economy. United States industries are no exception with hospitality, tourism, retail, restaurants, uh, bars, entertainment, manufacturing, and so many others, all facing a host of new challenges and barriers, things that disrupt operations and impede growth. Here in Maine, of course, the closure of the Canadian border has affected us. That's about 17% of our tourism industry right there. The stoppage of cruise ships likewise, likewise has affected um, tourism industries, hospitality industries, and farms and fisheries, which supply goods to the, tur to the cruise ships. Um, and the reluctance of people to travel generally across the country uh, have all impacted our economy from farms and fisheries to retail, recreation, and hospitality sectors and others. Still, so many small businesses in Maine have really risen to the task and I'm very appreciative of what they've done. Um, their, their cooperation in protecting the Maine people has been outstanding. And they often they have to sacrifice a lot of market share while doing these things to protect their customers and protect the people across the state of Maine. In some of the letters I got, they said things like, quote, as a small business owner, it has been tough, but we all need to do what's necessary to stop the spread. Or, quote, my business will struggle and so will others, but we're talking about the lives of Mainers and that needs to come first. And, quote, we are stronger, we are smarter, and we do not cave in hard, cave in, in hard times. We're smarter than this virus and we're ready to do what we need in order to protect our family and everyone else's family, end quote. That's right, Maine people don't cave during hard times. We're tough, we're resilient, and Maine business owners have generally done all they can to slow the spread of this virus across the state. Dr. Shah's announcement that our one day um, positivity rate of being, being under, one, under half a percent is proof positive that small businesses and individuals across the state and families are protecting themselves and others and all of us. And that cooperation will continue. Well, small businesses in particular have been hurt hard economically. So my administration wants to do whatever we can within available resources to support those local businesses through, through these tough times that continue. Some of these small businesses and small nonprofits have not been able to ex access existing resources and sources of funding, relief monies, and they've fallen through the cracks, while others have exhausted the support they've uh, received and now they need more help in order to remain viable. So today we're launching the Maine Economic Recovery Grant Program to support Maine small businesses and nonprofits as they grapple with the economic hardship caused by COVID-19. This program will be backed by $200 million in federal CARES Act coronavirus relief funds. And it will provide financial relief for those entities that incurred business disruptions caused by the pandemic. In order to qualify for these funds, a business or nonprofit organization must demonstrate a financial need, a need for financial relief based on lost revenues minus expenses since March 1, 2020 disruptions caused by the COVID-19 impacts or related public health expenses and responses. The business organization must have its base in Maine, meaning it is headquartered here, or it has at least half of its employees and contract employees in the aggregate based in Maine and employ fewer than 50 employees and or contract employees. These grants may be used to cover certain expenses like payroll costs, rent or mortgage payments for business facilities, utility payments, expenses incurred in replenishing inventory or other necessary reopening costs, or the purchase of personal protective equipment required by the business. Small businesses and nonprofit organizations can apply for grants beginning tomorrow and through September 9, 2020, with awards to be made in early October. The amount awarded will be based on demonstrated need as a prorated percentage of the total cost of business, business interruption reported by all qualified applicants. In order to avoid a competitive rush on these uh, grants, they will not be distributed on a first come first, first, say, 
first come first serve basis, but based on the criteria we've just established. We know the money available for these grants can't possibly wholly replace or repair the economic damage this pandemic has caused. We know that a lot more support is needed and we sincerely hope that Congress will step up to the plate and provide more relief to the people and to the state of Maine, to the small farms, the mom and pop stores, the small motels and retailers across the state and across the nation. Those small businesses are truly the backbone of our economy and the life lifeblood of all our communities. We can't let them fail. Our narrow mission here is to ensure that each dollar that we have has at least a small direct impact on supporting the small businesses and supporting Maine's economy generally. To learn about more, to learn more about the Maine Economic Recovery Grant Program, people are invited to visit the Department of Economic and Community Development's website at maine.gov backslash DECD, maine.gov backslash DECD. Small businesses can begin applying, as I said, tomorrow, August 21st. To all Maine people, once again, remember to wash your hands frequently. Maintain six feet of distance between yourself and others. Stay home when you can, especially if you're older or have an underlying health condition. Wear a face cloth covering, cloth face covering when you're out in public to protect others. If we continue to protect ourselves and protect one another in these ways, we can keep our small businesses going and we can start the road to economic recovery while limiting the spread of this dangerous virus as Maine people have done for many months now. It's all up to all of us. Thank you and be happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you, Governor. Uh, before we turn to our colleagues in the media, Commissioner Lambrew, could I turn it over to you, please? Sure, I'll be brief. Today, we announced the launch of five new swab and send COVID-19 testing sites further expanding access to reliable and timely testing for Maine people and visitors. The new Maine Health sites are in Damerskata, Rockport, Brunswick, Norway, and Farmington. They will open next week and Maine Health will begin accepting appointments today. We are also announcing that a mobile testing site or drive-through testing site operated by Pro-America Health, which we first announced last month, will start its operations at the Maine Visitors Information Center in Kittery on Tuesday, August 25th. ProAmerica will begin accepting appointments beginning this evening at covidtestforme.com. It will operate from 9 to 4 p.m. Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Saturdays, and from noon to 7 p.m. on Thursdays and Fridays through the end of August, with similar hours in September. This will be our first swab and send site in your county, we urge people to make reservations soon. All together, this brings a statewide total of swab and send locations to 27, ensuring that approximately 90% of residents can get tested within 30 minutes of their home. Ensuring that people across Maine can protect themselves, their loved ones, and their communities by getting tested when at risk of COVID-19 is critical to keeping the state's infection rates low. We thank Maine Health, ProAmerica, and all the other healthcare organizations that have partnered with us to provide timely, accurate, and affordable testing to protect Maine people and visitors alike. With that, I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Shaw, for questions. Thanks, Commissioner. Um, and today's first question goes to Joe from ABC7. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Uh, the first question I have for you revolves around some reports and conversations that have come up about out-of-state residents coming in and enrolling their children into schools. And the question is, is there any concern about this or has there any been any discussion about the risk this could imply? Um, you know, Joe, I'm not aware of reports of that nature. What, what I would say is that as with any individual coming into the state of Maine from any other state, provided it's not one of the five states that are exempt from quarantine or testing requirements, those individuals should be coming in to make sure as they come in, they have a negative test with them or that they obtain one upon arrival, for example, at one of the swab and send sites that Commissioner Lamber noted. Maybe I can add as well, uh, Dr. Shah, that we welcome people to move here. We've always had an open door 
uh, from those particular states. We just want them to get tested before they come here. Once they come here, they're welcome to buy property, rent a, rent a place to live here, and enroll their kids in school here. We welcome them. Thanks, Joe. I'm gonna turn now to Patty White at Maine Public. Thank you very much. I've got a couple questions about the wedding outbreak and then one more if I may, but um, how many people associated with the wedding outbreak are hospitalized? And also the imminent health hazard citation. Can you tell us what that means exactly? Is that a financial penalty? Sure, Patty. Right now at this time, we believe that we understand that there is one individual associated with this outbreak who is hospitalized. Uh, with respect to the imminent health hazard, uh, really what it is is it's it's an official notice from the department, from the agency, that they have not abided with one or more health-related regulations. It puts them on notice of that. It also asks them to comply in the future. When it was delivered to the owners of the Big Moose Inn, they did intend and agreed and signal that they will comply with all of these issues and all of the issues that were cited going forward. Uh, there is no immediate financial penalty associated with it. If there is further evidence of non-compliance, that's when financial penalties start coming in, if we get to that point. Okay, thanks. And then one other question I had, we're doing really well on so many metrics in terms of the positivity rate and hospitalization rate, but the positivity rate is ticking up a little bit, it looks like, and our reproductive number is also going up. I'm wondering um, why do you think we're sliding on some of those metrics and how concerned are you about it? Well, it is the case that about a week ago, our positivity rate was a little bit lower, is about 0 0.64, 0 0.65%. Uh, the question is, even though there's a numerical difference between those, whether there's a biological difference between a positivity rate of 0.65 and a positivity rate of 0.78. Uh, that's really the epidemiological question. Uh, certainly, we've had additional cases that have been discovered and cataloged in the last week as compared to prior weeks. Some of that is related to the outbreaks that we've been discussing over the past several days. Some of it is also a function of the fact that we're now regularly reporting or getting reports of anywhere from 2,900 to over 3,000 tests per day. So there are some factors that have changed just in the past two weeks that could account for why there are additional cases. When additional cases are detected, the reproductive number that you mentioned will go up. That number is based on changes in the number of cases on a day-to-day -day level. And so when you go from having 20, 10 to 12 cases for five or six days to having 18 to 20 for five or six days, that number is going to go up. Uh, what the real question here is whether there is increased spread of COVID-19 or whether there's better detection of COVID-19 as a result of expanded testing. And frankly, Patty, I think what we can say is that there's both. There's additional spread that's happening, but there's also better detection of it. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to turn next to Stephen Porter at the at Seacoast. Thank you, Dr. Shaw, and, and thank you also for the update about the York County Jail outbreak investigation. I have two closely related follow-up questions about that, one for you, Dr. Shaw, and the other for Governor Mills. For Dr. Shaw, I understand that Maine CDC is still early in its investigation, but based on what you know about the volume of testing that has been taking place in Maine correctional facilities, how confident are you that there is not already a widespread outbreak of COVID-19 at York County Jail? <clears throat> that's, that's really the focus of our investigation, is to determine whether the four cases that we've seen thus far represent all of the transmission that's occurred or whether it's just the first phase. Right now, Steve, to be candid with you, we're in about hour four of our investigation. And so it's too early to say whether we've detected all the cases or whether there might be additional ones. That is the precise reason why universal testing at the facility among inmates as well as employees is so critical. Our public health emergency preparedness team, the FEP team, has already been working with the jail to furnish them with testing supplies so they can conduct that testing on employees get it up to our lab at Augusta and get a result. Then and only then will we have a better picture of what's going on. Understood, thank you. And then for Governor Mills, really along the same lines, um, what reassurance statewide can you offer that the, the state of Maine isn't putting people at heightened risk just by virtue of their being incarcerated? Mm -hmm. yeah.
Governor, you went back on mute. Okay, I'm there. Uh, thanks for the question, Steve. You know, uh, we've been very fortunate, especially compared to other states. Uh, we have had no serious outbreaks in uh, correctional facilities. We've had, we had, I think, one or two cases in Wyndham early on, um, no spread, and nothing at the, the prison at Thomaston or Bolduck, um, the other, other, any of the other facilities. So while we start to loosen restrictions on visitation and that kind of thing, uh, we think people are pretty safe. Those who are incarcerated, pre-trial or post-sentencing, uh, remain pr in pretty safe uh, status in our state. I'm going to turn now to Spencer Roberts at WABI. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Long-time listener, first-time caller. Um, I, with the big moose in, uh, with the imminent health hazard citation, is the Tri-Town Baptist Church also facing a similar citation? So we're, we're trying, we're right now still investigating, again, more of the contours of the gatherings that occurred. Uh, as we learn more about who was where and what in what numbers, that will determine where we go from any other direction from here, both as an epidemiological matter, as well as from other fronts. Right now, it's too early to say, we're still gathering additional information. And then real quickly about uh, the cases connected to Foxcroft Academy, Academy there's some concern that the those that tested positive are student athletes. Is there any uh, knowledge on how that might affect school sports, seeing as the, the main principals association I know has not yet made a decision on that matter? Sure. Um, I, I, what, what, I will, what I will tell you there, Spencer, is that um, it, we don't comment on any of the specifics around individual cases. So I can't really go into details about how many were students versus non-students. Um, just as a matter of policy, and we do that to protect privacy of any individuals who are associated with outbreaks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to turn next to Joe Lawler at the Press Herald. Um, yes, hi. Thanks for uh, uh, taking our, our, our uh, questions. Uh, my first question is to Governor Mills. Um, you seem to indicate that uh, the, the $200 million is... Uh, you know, short-term funding and that there needs to be more, more funding. Um, if you do another round uh, later in the fall, uh, would there need to be additional money appropriated by Congress or could you do a, a second round uh, with existing CARES Act funding? Um, thanks, Joe. I think I'm unmuted. Um, right now we're planning on this tranche of money and hoping that Congress will come through with a much more significant uh, stimulus package that will help all kinds of businesses at all levels and help state and municipal governments as well. And not only help them in the interim, but in the long term into next year. Our budget year goes to next July or next July 1, uh, but biannual budget. And then we're gonna deal with what the Revenue Forecasting Committee reported as being um, um, troubling, projections into the next biennium. So right now the coronavirus relief money, we're only allowed to use it through December of this year. Uh, and uh, we're not given the appropriate flexibility to do some other things with it we'd like to do. And so we're waiting for Congress to act. I think there's consensus around some of those things, just a matter of getting uh, Mr. Meadows and the uh, Senate Republicans and Senate Democrats together to agree on a package, uh, hopefully something similar to what the House already passed. Thank you. Uh, my uh, follow-up question is to um, uh, to uh, Commissioner Johnson about um, school sports. Uh, we noticed that uh, soccer was listed as high risk uh, by Maine, but um, the NFHS, uh, uh, National Federation of School um, uh, High School Sports, um, they list soccer as moderate risk. Uh, can you explain what the differences are? And is there a way to uh, uh, design soccer to move it from high risk to moderate risk? So, Joe, thank you for the question. I'm actually going to pass this question to Commissioner Lambrew because that's actually a public health part of the public health discussion. Um, Commissioner? Sure. And I'm going to comment mostly on the process for the guidelines, not the specifics of your question, primarily because I think we're always looking at the details in these guidance documents to see how they align with different ones. 
But to pull back, the Department of Education and the Department of Health and Human Services have worked with public health experts since May to develop guidance for all sorts of sectors, including physical education classes in schools. Such classes are universal for all Maine children, including those who have medical conditions. Physical education classes are different than school-based sports. We have not issued guidance for school-based sports. What we do at the state level is fill in gaps where guidance does not exist. As such, earlier in the year, we developed guidance for community sports that you just referenced. That guidance was requested to fill in the gap for summer leagues and sports outside of school settings. The Maine Principals Association in the summer issued its own guidance for school-based sports. We have clarified for the association that the physical education guidance does not apply in the circumstances that they're discussing, that they're looking at. We also recommended that they consider the community sports guidance in finalizing their own guidance. We stand ready to answer any additional questions as the Maine Principals Association makes its final recommendations. And we appreciate the challenge in developing guidance for sports in the midst of a pandemic. We share many Mainers' passion for promoting physical activity safely, and we are hopeful that the Maine Principals Association um, looks hard at the guidance and makes smart decisions. Thanks, Joe. We're going to turn now to Samantha York at News Center. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a couple questions. First, for Dr. Shaw. Um, I'm not sure if you saw that there was a new study released by Mass General Hospital that shows that kids can carry a heavy virus load, uh, especially in their nose and throats. Wondering how significant these findings are and could this lead to uh, rethinking the strategies being used to reopen schools? Sure, um, so Samantha, I'm, I'm aware of that paper as well as one that was a few, a few weeks ago uh, by a separate group of researchers at Northwestern that found similar findings. The fact is, um, so when we think about COVID, anything related to COVID, Question number one is, is this finding about COVID, this new paper, different from any other type of infectious disease or is it unique to COVID? And when we think about other infectious diseases, what we find is whether that's the measles virus, chicken pox, or just about any other infectious disease that can affect children and adults, we find that just as with all the others, COVID does and can be found in high volumes within children whether it's in their nasal passages, in their throats, in their lungs. Well, the question then is what to make of this, or ultimately, does th do these high levels of virus that have been found, does it mean that children are capable of spreading the disease more readily than adults are? And right now, there's not great data, it's not well characterized as to what extent children can spread COVID-19 to say other children or to adults. We know that it has happened, but we don't know the magnitude of which that risk is present. That's one of the reasons why, number one, there's additional research underway to better characterize that risk. We know that it's there, but is it as high as other risks that are out there relative to other infectious diseases? Number two, it's one of the fundamental reasons why as we think about school reopening, there are six criteria that all schools must abide if they are going to have classroom education. And one of those, one of those bedrock principles is the wearing of a face covering, such that even if children do have high levels of virus, the face covering acts as a great physical barrier to prevent them from transmitting it to others. Great, thank you so much. Um, and my second question is for uh, Governor Mills. Um, in the past, I know there was talk surrounding providing additional funding for schools in the state. And I'm just wondering um, where you guys are at with that funding. And I know that teachers already go into their own pockets to buy you know, school supplies. In this new world where we don't want sharing, in addition to PPE, is there any consideration for money going to general supplies for teachers? I'm sorry, the question was about money going to education and the 170 odd million that we have put out there already for schools. Right, I'm just seeing if that, has that already been distributed, you're saying? It's been put out there, it has, it has not all been allocated or distributed. We, we're expecting specific plans from school districts on how, you know, it's just not a blank check. Mm. It involves, uh, it requires um, the school to have uh, certain parameters and, and comply with the six, six uh, checklist um, requirements for in, in school, in uh, 
classroom instruction, that kind of thing. So no, it has not all been spent, so to speak. Okay, wonderful. And then as far as um, having any additional funding for teachers and general supplies, have you guys thought about anything like that in addition to PPE? For general supplies, like pencils, pay, uh, no, I mean, general just purpose thinking again, Sorry, sorry in the, just in thinking of the age of not sharing things. Um, you know, they're probably going oh, to more, mean. you know what? Yeah. So just wondering yeah. if there has been any consideration. I don't know that that is a specific thing that any, any particular school district has proposed to use the money for. So I really can't answer that. I mean, it might be something if they, if they require additional, um, well, obviously disinfectants and school supplies in terms of cleaning supplies would be among the, uh, uh, eligible uh, costs, uh, whether, whether teachers are buying other supplies, extra supplies based on the precautions, I'm not clear and I'm not sure that uh, any districts have applied for that. Great, thank you so much. Now, I do appreciate, my mother was a school teacher for 37 years and I know how much they shell out of pocket every, every week of the school year, regardless of the pandemic. And I imagine that this is an additional hardship on on teachers trying to prepare for classroom instruction and or remote instruction. And we'll do the best we can to help them in every way. Thank you so much. I'm gonna turn now to Evan Pop at the Main Beacon. Thank you so much. Um, I have two questions for the governor related to planning around the decreased state revenues due to the pandemic. Um, to start with, when it comes to um, proposals for cuts to state departments, are any cuts to healthcare programs, including Medicaid, on the table, or have you ruled out cuts to healthcare programs during the pandemic? Healthcare programs is a pretty big uh, term, a very broad term. Right now, during in the congressional uh, package passed earlier this year, there's a higher FMAP rate awarded to the states. Uh, we are taking advantage of that. We are so pleased that we do have Medicaid expansion, main care expansion, and now tens of thousands of people additional are, are eligible for main care and getting health care who would not have been eligible before. You know, we are also using federal funds to fill in the gaps and to help people with substance use disorder at the same time. You know, we've lost probably more than twice as many people to overdose deaths in, in, in the course of this current year as we have to COVID-19 deaths. Um, they're both, pen, both epidemics and we're trying to um, address both of them at the same time. So we are, we are using every federal dollar we can to protect Maine people, protect the public health of all our families across the state of Maine. When you talk about cuts, I think we're really talking about curtailments, which is a different thing than cuts. Curtailments is particularly as it relates to the general fund, not so much federal funds, but <clears throat> Curtailments envision not putting out, not spending a certain amount of general funds that are already appropriated and allocated to the departments, uh, appropriated by the legislature, just not spent. For instance, travel, um, out-of-state travel, things of that sort, or in-state travel for many employees, uh, not filling some vacancies. Uh, but I don't envision rejecting any federal funds or not taking advantage of all possible federal funds for things like child care and health care and education, maximum extent possible. Um, I'm sorry, Governor, just to, to follow up on that, though, um, are, are you saying that cuts or curtailments to um, state funding to health care programs would still be on the table? Well, when you say health care programs, that's a pretty broad term. Um, mm -hmm. Such as Medicaid or um, the, Medicaid. the version of Medicaid. <laughs> Medicaid covers a lot of things. And we don't envision cutting back on Medicaid because it's vital to the health of Maine families. Great, thank you. Um, and my second question um, is, there have been some tax fairness proposals to address the um, state revenue crunch, including repealing tax breaks for wealthy individuals um, passed under the previous administration or implementing 3% surcharge on incomes over 200,000 uh, passed by referendum in 2016, but never carried out. And I'm wondering, um, are these, kinds of solutions on the table for you in terms of the budget crunch, or are you only um, looking at cuts at this point? Those are not things that I could do by curtailment or by executive order during an emergency as we have today. Those are things that would have to be enacted by the legislature. If those come up in January or, or beyond, I'll certainly read them carefully and um, 
hope to understand them better than what you've just summarized, but uh, they're not something I can do unilaterally. But um, have you have you spoken to Democratic um, legislative leaders about recalling the legislature, um, or they have have they asked you to do so? I mean, calling them into special session at this time. Yes. Obviously, it's it would not be timely to call them in for August. We are still waiting to hear from the Congress of the United States and the President about what more federal relief, more stimulus money, funds, and programs will be available. Um, we have been in touch with legislative leaders constantly, uh, and my cabinet members have been in touch with the chairs and leads of their various committees of jurisdiction over what we can be doing right now on an, ur on an urgent basis to fulfill the needs of, say, schools reopening, say, healthcare needs, say, small business operations and grants, such as we're talking about today. But uh, we have not. I'm not committed one way or the other to calling the legislature into special session at some point. Right now, our departments, all of them, are focused entirely on addressing this epidemic, whether it's DOT workers delivering PPE to different areas of the state, Department of Corrections workers and inmates manufacturing PPE and, and distributing it around the state, the MEMA people doing something similar and the National Guard helping fit people with N95s, all the, all the people in the Department of Health and Human Services looking out to protect children, to protect people in nursing homes, to protect others um, with serious urgent needs. The Department of Education focused solely on how to get kids back into the system, how to not lose kids, have them fall through the cracks and fall off that academic cliff that I so so fear many people, many kids have done now, uh, have already done. So our our administration is still focused on the pandemic. Um, and I do talk to legislative leaders um, frequently. And my office is in constant touch with them. Um, but now, obviously, it's too late to call them in for August. Um, but I'm not committed one way or the other to calling them back in a special session at some point in the future. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. I'm going to turn now to Patrick Whittle at the AP. Patrick, there you are. And you're on mute. Now I'm not. Okay. Um, I, uh, I I do have a question. Before I ask it, I just wanted to double check a couple of stats. There are at the Big Moose in case, there are 32 confirmed cases. Is that right? 26 confirmed, uh, 32 total, 26 are confirmed, six are probable. Okay. And the reason why they were served the, the, uh, the citation about uh, hazard to health was specifically because of violating the 50 person rule? That's correct. Uh, there, there were some other, there were two other findings as well, or one other finding as well, namely that they were operating in excess of the capacity of their license. Uh, as an eating establishment, uh, that one as well, but also for uh, exceeding the the threshold set in the governor's executive orders for indoor gatherings. Got it. Okay. Um, thank you for that. My uh, my question, however, pertains to the bear hunt. The bear hunt starts in about a week and a half, and we've been down this road before with the turkey hunt, but the bear hunt is different because it's a major driver of out-of-state tourism into Maine. And I'm curious if the state is planning on taking any steps to, to <laughs> that because we will we will have people, people are still going to come here to to try to hunt bears and it's an influx of, of, uh, of tourism that I'm sure there's some kind of plan for. Boy, I, I think I'm gonna to defer to Judy Camusa, Commissioner of Inland Fish and Wildlife, but we welcome people to come here and hunt and fish and, and uh, enjoy our, our wonderful sporting sporting uh, uh, camps way out in the woods. And uh, we still have a lot of wilderness to share uh, and a lot of uh, sports to uh, to uh, share with people from other states all over the country. There's no special, I'm not sure there's a need for special precautions. The same ones, the same travel precautions would apply to hunters as would apply to other visitors to the state from other states. So the I'm, I'm assuming then that the, the the travel rules, the lodging rules are going to be the same as they are for everyone else who's coming here. And the social distancing rules will be similar to what the state did during the turkey hunt where people will be asked to 
hunt with members of their own households, things like that. As far as lodging is concerned, Pat, Patrick, or you mean, I mean, you don't usually go up, go out in groups of five or six together to go hunt. I mean, it's, yeah, the same rules would apply. <laughs> right. Got it. I'm going to turn now to Michael Shepard at the BDN. Welcome back, Mike. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I have a quick question for Dr. Shaw, then just a couple quick ones for the governor. Dr. Shaw, the big news in, just to clarify, is that the only lodging establishment or restaurant uh, cited for going over gathering limits so far? You're just making sure the answer is yes. Yes, that is correct. Okay. And uh, that was easy. Now, uh, Governor, that your business aid program today, it, it falls short of the 350 million that the uh, Economic Recovery Committee called for. Is this going to be the extent of business aid with at least that pool of CARES Act money? And you've also got uh, 440 million or so by my count in uncommitted funds. When are you going to when are you going to flesh out the plan for that? I think, thanks, Mike. As I've said before, what we do ultimately with uh, the entire bundle of uh, COVID relief money from the Congress that we've received to date uh, depends a great deal a great deal on what the, what else the Congress does. First of all, our hands are kind of tied in how we can use that money. We've been very respectful of the Treasury um, uh, restrictions and getting new updates and, and Department of Treasury uh, frequently asked questions and guidances uh, from week to week to make sure we're doing what we only what we can do and what we can do, everything that we can do with those funds, because I think they're vital. Um, the answer to the first question is basically, at this time, this is what we can allocate to this program. And probably not more, but we are also waiting and hoping for Congress to act, for the president and Mr. Meadows, his chief of staff, and the Senate Republicans and Democrats to sit, sit back at the table and negotiate a significant relief package for all the states and uh, including businesses, money for education, money for localities, for local governments, uh, money for health care and the like. Thank you. I'm going to turn now to Amy Brown at WERU. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Uh, back to the wedding outbreak, there were about 65 guests and there have been 26 to 32 cases. When it was initially reported, I think you mentioned that four of the cases were people who were not at the wedding, but may have contracted it from someone who was there. So what is the breakdown currently between people who are at the wedding? Because it sounds like nearly half of the people who are at this wedding were potentially infected, unless there were a lot more than four people now who were infected, but not there. Sure. So, you know, uh, Amy, this is a good example of how our understanding of what transpired and how transmission may have occurred uh, during an outbreak situation gets better and more refined as we learn more. So in this situation, you're right, there are about a total of 65 guests. Right now, there have been these 32 cases associated with it. Of those 32 cases, um, there are three that are among individuals who are not known to have attended either the wedding or the reception. So then there's a question of whether there were other forms of gathering that may have occurred outside of the wedding or the reception where transmission could have occurred that would account for those three cases. That's one thing our outbreak investigators are looking into right now. There's an alternative hypothesis that we simultaneously have to investigate, which is are those three cases connected to this outbreak at all? Or they could be, could they be related to some other epidemiological situation that's going on? Uh, it's a good example, again, of how when you go into an outbreak investigation, you always have to think about what you're not seeing in front of you. And then also whether there could have been other types of explanations that would explain the findings that you've got. So as we learn more, we'll maybe potentially connect these three cases to the outbreak in which case that number will go up from 32, or we'll find that they're independent or potentially linked to something else. Okay, and I don't know which of you this goes to, but are law enforcement personnel required to wear masks while they're working in Maine, or is that left up to the individual agencies? And specifically, do you know if prison guards are regularly, I know you've mentioned supplying PPE, are they regularly wearing it when they're interacting 
with prisoners? When they're interacting with prisoners, I believe so. I think they are following that protocol, that uh, guidance. Um, if they're in their office alone, perhaps not, or if they're coming to and from work, probably not if they're alone. Um, same rules would apply to, that, that apply to um, everyone else. Okay, thank you. Oh, and actually, the, the first part of that question about other law enforcement agencies, I know in other states, there have been uh, sheriffs have come out and said that they actually ban anybody from wearing masks while they're working. Huh? Uh, is it a requirement here in Maine or is that left up to each individual sheriff department or police department? Our guidance on public health and wearing masks applies to everybody across the board, whether they wear a badge or a uniform, uh, whether they're in health care or education or law enforcement. Those rules and guidances apply across the board. I have not heard anybody saying, we're not going to do it department by, from, on behalf of any particular department. Okay, great. Thank you. And the final question for the afternoon goes to Allison Ross at WMTW. Thank you so much for taking my question. So just one question here. Now back to the wedding. Originally, I believe they were facing a fine of around $10,000. You can correct me if I'm wrong for breaking that gathering limit rule. Now, is there a reason that there's no financial penalty or would that have been the next step if they broke the rules again or agreed that they're not gonna follow the rules? Sure, oh, Governor. Yeah. So I'll go ahead and start and then welcome others. Um, Allison, the, uh, I'm not sure about the $10,000 figure. What, what I will tell you is that at least as to the main CDC's health inspection program, which oversees things like restaurants, gathering places of this nature, the first step in our process of working with any, any, any licensed entity such as this one is uh, to issue this IHH, the imminent health hazard. Uh, there's no financial penalty associated with that given the way that our system is structured. If we get into a situation where there is repeated violation, if we get there, then the next step is a temporary suspension at which point financial penalties can be assessed. But step one is the imminent health hazard. In this situation, the proprietors of the Big Moose Inn have fully agreed to comply with what was outlined. And so at this time, that second phase is not one that comes into the picture. That's the phase at which financial penalties would be assessed. Oops, and let me add what we've been talking about going back some months. Let me just say hypothetically, not, with relation, not in relation to this particular incident or this particular business. Um, but with respect to doing business generally, especially public facing businesses, there are a lot of layers and levels of potential sanctions, including very basically consumer marketing, consumer choice. When people read in the newspaper or they hear that a business is not complying with the guidelines, I've heard from many people who say they just won't shop at that store, they won't go to that place, that kind of thing. Secondly, your, your, li your liability insurance uh, coverage may not apply uh, when you have not complied fully with health and human services uh, regulations and, and public health guidances, uh, such as we've uh, the checklist that we've been distributing for months now. And thirdly, there may be some law enforcement measure. Uh, violation of the an executive order is a criminal offense, potentially punishable by up to six months in jail uh, or and or fine. And, and then there's the uh, local compliance issues, potentially zoning issues, and there's um, potential, potential licensing issues, with, especially with uh, food um, organizations or liquor um, uh, organizations uh, and other organizations and entities that are licensed by the state or by local governments. All those levels of potential compliance or sanctions or enforcement are in play uh, with any business that uh, uh, is looking to comply or not comply with the executive orders. Great, thanks, Allison. Uh, Governor, again, that was the last question. I'll turn it back over to you. Oh, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Dr. Shah and uh, Commissioner Lambrew and Commissioner Johnson, who've been working so hard uh, day and night uh, to make sure that uh, we do everything we can at every level to uh, keep people safe in this state. Um, 
I get to go out weekends sometimes and visit places that I haven't regularly visited in the past. And um, it's a pleasure to be in the state of Maine, to enjoy this wonderful weather. Um, even though I know times are hard and things are difficult for a lot of people and families and businesses across the state, I invite the people watching and listening to take a day trip and go up to Lily Bay, for instance, so the beautiful beaches on Moosehead Lake and the mountains and the hiking areas and the Appalachian Trail, um, Baxter Park and uh, beautiful scenery there and the great trails for hiking there, Rangeley Lake and Mount Blue State Park and up to Quaddy Head. Take your kids, take your family out, do day trips or overnight trips, see the rest of Maine, see that part of Maine that you haven't been going to in recent months or years. Enjoy this beautiful state. There's so much to do out there. Um, stay local, be safe, uh, and I'll see you again next week. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.